The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. To start with, I would like to thank the two co-moderators for putting me, I, I know I shouldn't be thanking them for mod putting me up towards the end, but right after Maria, because she, uh, she uh, prepared the stage for my talk, I will be talking about a, a study that was done to examine a design model that will uh, size the amount of Europe needed in beams, in full scale and smaller scale beams, uh, so that we can improve the debonding strain. And I have some numbers on these improvements in FRP strengthened applications. As a background, I'm not going to dwell on too much. Uh, Europe encourages established to improve the effective FRP strain level of intermediate crack debonding failure. It is about time for a quantifiable model to account for the amount of the anchorage needed for a certain level of improvement. And it is important to assess the reliability of such model by testing the behavior under less or more amounts of anchorage provided to see how that will, will affect the improvement in the debonding uh, strain. So the research objectives of this study is to examine the effect of Europe anchorage amount for, uh, on improving the debonding strain, that's one and then to address the applicability of the debonding strain computation uh, in pre-cured laminates, which, is, which are, uh, uh, so the first one is done on sheets and the second one is done on pre-cured laminates and in addition to that, the improvement with Europe anchorage. So I have two experimental studies, they are small studies uh, composed of three specimens each. The first one has a beam tested under four-point bending, failed in flexure, and uh, the span of the beam is 15 and a half feet, which is about five meters. The cross-section is uh, T-section, so it uh, entertains FRP rupture failure mode if we manage to have uh, full, deep, full bonding of the FRP to the concrete. Uh, these are the dimensions uh, given here. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to uh, talk about them, but uh, I can share the slides with whoever is interested at the end. The first study uh, deals with sheets, and we have five layers we decided to uh, strengthen in flexure. These T-beams with five layers of uh, VRAP C100 high-strength carbon fiber reinforced polymer for flexure, and the reason why we selected five is we want to push the envelope, we want to reduce the debonding strain as much as possible, so we want to see if we can maximize the, the improvement of the uh, debonding strain as much as we can. And then the same material was used for the transverse Europe anchorage for one or two layers. The first beam was tested with uh, bonding the five layers of uh, flexural CFRP only. And as you can see uh, from this uh, uh, picture, the, the, the FRP debonded. And this is the ACI 440 equation for the debonding strain. Uh, most of you are familiar with it. And if we calculate the uh, debonding strain, it's going to be right here. And if we use this in a nonlinear uh, uh, analysis, beam analysis, uh, taking into account uh, concrete crushing, cracking, and uh, FRP behavior and steel bilinear behavior, I don't have time to go through the analysis uh, parameters. We will get uh, an ultimate load of 106 kilonewton from analysis. Uh, the experimental load uh, correspond, corresponding to that is 113.7 from the experiment. So uh, the first conclusion that we can draw is that uh, using the sheets, the, the ACI 440 
formula predicts reasonably well the, uh, uh, the failure uh, by debonding of the FRP. This is a load deflection response. Uh, the reason why we have a discrepancy here is because we didn't include tension stiffening that was fully cracked uh, section. So uh, we can easily adjust one of the parameters of the program and take it into account. But the most important thing is this is the ACI limit of 106.06, .06, and this is the maximum failure of the beam in experiment. Then next we will introduce the model that we, uh, that we extended to calculate the amount, the size the, of the UROPS that is needed. And basically this is an adapted uh, shear friction model from ACI 318, in which case uh, what we do is we calculate how much tension force in the FRP we need to develop right here at the critical section, which is this T sub F. And that's by saying that we want to fully anchor the FRP plate, so we use the FRP rupture strain. Then once we have this uh, force, we divide it by the shear span of the uh, beam. We get the shear force distribution along the shear friction interface or in interface of the, of the FRP, of the flexural FRP. And by using the shear friction formula with a mu ratio of 1.4 as per ACI 318-14, we can relate the shear force at shear friction plane to the tension force in the FRP UROPS. Basically, the mechanism is we have aggregate interlock. The shearing forces would want to shear off this aggregate interlock. So as a result, it want to overcome these uh, aggregate interlocks, so it will impose tension in these uh, UROPs, and as a result, the UROPs have internal forces of clamp which will act in clamping these cracks. So once we get the T shear friction, the tension uh, due to shear friction developed, we, it's basically a phi factor times the area of the UROPs times the stress in the UROPs, and by limiting the useful strain to 0.003 for full, Euro, for full wraps, uh, ACI 440 recommends 0.004 based on many research studies. We decided to limit that to 0.003 because it's UROPS. And as a result, we get into an equation that uh, defines the width of the UROP uh, for us in terms of the tension force divided by these three parameters. So when we go to the, first, the second beam, we, we have a, a tension force of around 370 kilonewtons that, uh, that is causing, uh, that, that is required to rupture the FRP. Uh, we calculate the shear friction force and the tension force, and from that we plug it into the equation to get the W sub F, which comes out to be 410 millimeters per meter. So we used two layers, we, we have the number two here, we intentionally uh, decided that we know that uh, we, we will need two layers. So we use two layers of 127 millimeter wide UROPs at uh, one foot uh, at 305 millimeters on center, which gives exactly, almost exactly the same amount of UROPs that is needed there. The interesting thing is that these UROPs cause FRP rupture in the, in the uh, in the, in the structural uh, longitudinal uh, FRP sheets, uh, the five layers of, of sheets. But the interesting uh, slide to show is the load versus deflection uh, comparison of the experiment in blue versus the analysis in red, showing the uh, three limits of the debonding at 106.06 .06 kilonewton that we had in the first specimen showing the anchored uh, FRP failing by rupture of FRP at 148.67 kilonewton and showing if the FRP sheets were perfectly bonded, it will rupture uh, by strain compatibility at 172.88 kilonewtons. So we had a huge improvement in the usable strain or debonding strain, even though we are not able to get to the, uh, to the maximum, 
but we, we came long ways, and I will quantify that in the next slide, and we were able to ra rupture fiber. Uh, not, uh, and the reason why there's a difference between this rupture of fiber and this rupture of fiber is because of bond slip that Maria talked about. This last specimen was uh, strengthened with the same five layers of CFRP, but strengthened with and the same UROPs, but one layer of UROPs, so half of the UROPs that was used, just to see the effect on the behavior. And this was the failure mode. Uh, surprisingly enough, it, we, we also ruptured the fiber, but we had more bond slip because we had less anchorage. And this is a shot that shows the cracking at the zone of the, uh, of the maximum uh, sec section. And the crack went all the way to halfway through the flange uh, as well. This picture shows the load deflection curve, and you can see the bond slip. In the previous uh, curve, the blue was above the red, and here the blue is uh, below. Uh, so uh, we, have, uh, we have had some bond slip, and the load was exactly the same as the debonding load, 113.7 kilonewtons. So basically what happened is that the, uh, the UROPs were not able to clamp this FRP sheets. Once we reached debonding, we, we basically slipped and ruptured uh, the FRP uh, sheets. So as a summary for the first study, we had an improvement factor uh, when we used the shear friction model that was developed of 1.78 based on uh, the debonding strain. When we used half of the amount of the CFRP, uh, we ruptured the fiber also, but the kappa factor was 1.14. It is actually practically 1.00 when we use the experimental debonding level as opposed to the ACI 440 debonding level because there was a little bit of a difference. And when you have perfect bond, your kappa factor should be 2.26. So use at least the shear friction model uh, to size the UROPs in this case. The second study is using pre-cured laminates. And here we have five and a half feet uh, span, clear span, which is 1.7 meters span, so it's a slightly a smaller beam, 110 by 180 millimeter uh, rectangular cross section. The first beam, which is a control beam that didn't have any UROPs, failed by cover delamination even prior to yielding of the reinforcement because the pre-cured laminates were sizable compared to the size of the cross-section. And that's always the case when you use pre-cured -pre laminates. And we noticed that here that if we use ACI 440, we are very unconservative because the ultimate load comes out to be 139.4 kilonewtons compared to the experimental, which was 60.7 kilonewton. So we have to reduce the epsilon FD significantly in order to match by analysis what we get by the experiment, which, which is suggested here to change from 0.41 to 0.14, the coefficient in front of the, uh, the radical. I'm not suggesting this change, but I'm just showing it for comparative reason purposes. The shear friction model was followed the same way. Here we have concrete crushing failure mode if we were to perfectly bond the FRP, the longitudinal FRP. So we calculate how much is the T that corresponds to uh, concrete crushing. Then we calculated the WF, which was 295 millimeters per meter. And then we sized the UROPs accordingly. Uh, it's slightly higher uh, value than the, what we came up with uh, for practical purposes. This is the layout of the beam. And the epsilon FD was, came out to be 0 0.0021 uh, with a kappa factor of 1.11. So when we use the uh, shear friction model, uh, we have a small improvement with pre-cured laminates of 1.11 uh, strain above the debonding strain. And when we use double that amount, uh, double the amount of the UROPs, so we double the uh, UROPs at the ends, we get an improvement factor of 1.46, uh, 
uh, which is uh, which is in the reasonable range, uh, in the useful range uh, in this case. So as a summary for the second study, uh, using the ACI 440 debonding equation, strain equation in case of covered delamination was unconservative in case of pre-cured laminates. Using the shear friction model to size the Europe's debonded the CFRP at a kappa of 1.11. And using the uh, twice as much URAP, still um, debonded the FRP at uh, 1.46 kappa uh, range or factor. By assuming the perfect bond, we would uh, reach kappa of 3.5, which is not achievable by the shear friction model for uh, pre cured laminates. So use at least, uh, based on this result, twice the shear friction amount of the URAP. And in conclusion, I would like to say that uh, ACI 440 debonding strain equation for sheets is accurate, but for pre-cured laminates is unconservative, so we have to pay attention to that and, and uh, suggest some modification to the, uh, to the code, uh, to the guidelines uh, based on that. And also using the shear friction amount for Europe's gave you 1.78 kappa, uh, whereas using twice the shear friction amount, in this case, gave 1.46. So use at least the specified amount of the, the calculated amount according to the model, or twice as much as that if we want a range of 1.4 to 1.5. With that, I will close and open it out to questions. So I know I we, questions. Okay. we're starting to run low on energy, but we'll have time. Uh -huh. uh, you, is it possible to wrap a completely around the room? Well, you have slabs, so that's yes. why we use T-sections, yeah. yes. because usually we have slabs and we don't want to drill into the slabs to use the full U-wraps. Yeah. So that's why we use the, uh, the full wraps, so that's why you use the U-wraps. Very costly. Oh, that's what you wrap. Yeah, I understand that. Next question that I have is, uh, I'm, I'm Has anyone done this uh, beam test with the URAP or whatever uh, on the fire load? I don't think so, not that I know of. Uh, however, if you, if you have fire, you, you always have in the design guideline a strengthening limit that will tell you if you lose all the FRP, you have to be able to carry 1.1 dead load plus 0.75 live load. So this way there won't be any collapse. And then once, once that, that event is over, you can replace the FRP with a new fresh FRP. So, uh, so that, that, uh, that, uh, that is taken into account by the code. But if it's a brand new structure, there's no reason to use all this, uh, all this uh, FRP, URAP and everything else. No, but the URAPs are going to save you a lot of the material because if you use just the uh, flexural uh, FRP, you're going, to be, uh, you're going to be penalizing yourself a lot by using a lot of material which will give you a low strain level. Whereas if you use the URAPs, uh, they, will, uh, uh, they will increase the amount of material, that, uh, I'm sorry, the amount of the strain that you allow the structure to carry and thus the ultimate capacity of the... Yes. Yes, that's, that's a very good suggestion, and there has been a study where there, there is a full sheet of, of wrapping in the transverse direction uh, across the entire beam. Uh, however, uh, uh, we, we work with uh, DOTs, and they always argue against that because they want to see if the, these sheets debond in, uh, in real life. Uh, if you bond the entire sheet, you're not going to be able to detect unless you have to use uh, thermography or something like that to detect these debonding uh, that, that may happen there. So. Thank you very much.